Okay, so I'm Andrew Plackham. Uh, I am a text adventure person. I've been working in text adventures, well, realistically since I was uh, 25. In actuality, since I was probably 10 or 8 the first time I saw one and said, okay, I have to start doing these. Um, I think that was on some kind of a horrible mainframe terminal at uh, my father's workplace in 1978. Um, it was clearly the best kind of computer game. It was really the only kind of computer game I'd seen at the time in 1978, up in more like But uh, for about the next oh, five, ten years, text adventures were not the only kind of computer game, but they were clearly the superior kind of computer game, and everybody knew that. It was, if you look at um, I'm reiterating stuff from Jason Scott's tech, uh, text adventure documentary, but if you look at computer magazine ratings, uh, computer game ratings. In early 80s, there was, you know, there were the early Ultima games, there were the early Wizardry games, there were lots of early arcade games, but um, text adventure and Infocom games were always at the top of the list as the most well-written, the most mature, uh, the most highly polished kind of computer game you can do. Um, and by 1990, that had entirely washed away, and you could look at them again, except there was a big crowd of hobbyists, at first reverse engineering Infocom's technology, later building new compilers uh, around that technology, and uh, that can, has continued from the early 90s up until present, with my questionable presence as a, uh, one of the people in the field messing around with, with APIs and uh, virtual machines and so forth. So, on the screen you see the tool that I currently use, it is not a tool I designed, although I use some, I designed some of the infrastructure that's behind it at this point, really low level VM stuff. Uh, this is Graham Nelson's Inform. Um, it is an unusual programming language, and I like to talk about it because it's something that programmers really haven't seen very much. <clears throat> um, of course, it looks like a standard uh, programming development environment. This is what you would see when you start a new project. Uh, it fills in your name and the, uh, the name of the project for you. Mm. So just as an example, the first thing you do, actually, actually, that's first. Who here, other than Val, has uh, worked with Inform 7 before? No. You. Wave your hand. Excellent. I don't know your name. We'll catch up. Um, so this is, this IDE is available for Mac and Windows, and there are some Linux ports. Although I'm not sure if they're all completely easy to install, but you know that's what I like to get. Um, if you grab it and install it and just fire a project and hit compile, it will immediately uh, display an error. But it's not, at least we'd like to say, it's not a completely awful error. It says clearly what the problem is, you haven't in any locations. Text adventures are strongly modeled in the physical world and you have to have at least some abstraction of a place for the player to be. And it tells you, for example, you could try typing the observatories or Try that. It'll compile, and immediately I'm in a room with a poorly capitalized observatory. So this is a standard text adventure um, game example. It's a fully running game. It has one room. There's no descriptions. There's no objects. But if you try all the things that are familiar in text adventures, like go north, it will have sensible responses. Have all the team and such thing. Examine me as a default response, but there is a me object actually in the room, and it responds to verb. Get me. Get me. It will have a smart ass error because Grandma Nelson really likes dry British smart ass answers. Um, the point is that uh, the standard library has the standard verbs and the standard relations and interactions built into it, and that just plopped into your game for you. Why is this interesting? So far, it isn't. Um, I'm not going to get the description of the room. <clears throat> and then I would try running it. And now I have a room with the description. Uh, exactly the same as before, but now there is text attached to the room. So, <clears throat> how do we go from here? I'm going to stop
Right. So this usual thing that we try to do next is we add an object. Uh, we will take looking randomly a microphone stand. I spy with my little eye. Now we have room with an object. And um, it's already split the, uh, the name down into synonym words. So you could examine the stand. Don't do that correctly. You could take a microphone, it work. The, by default, to take a logic. If you take an inventory, you're carrying it. As a game, this is very boring. But as a piece of source code, it's actually kind of cool because you look at it, and you, if I were to just hand you this block of text, you wouldn't necessarily recognize it as source code. You would recognize it as a description of a very small game. And this is the way Inform 7 is built. It's as close as anyone has come to natural language programming. And I know that's not very close. But for all the effort people have expended on natural language programming over the years, um, it's surprising how much progress hasn't been made. I mean, it's kind of a cliche to say this programming can be programmed just like telling the computer what to do, because every language, you know, Python has some like boilerplate text that is trying to do that. COBOL was designed to like it, it, SQL. It's like, yes, we put in English keywords, people will think it's English, and they can just program magically. This is never true. But the reason it's not true is because it's really hard. I think this is a better example than most of the uh, even modern examples because the nice thing about this uh, Inform 7 as a language is that the problem domain, this space of abstracted objects, is pretty much what you want to build your program on. Right? A program is a space of abstracted objects. In the game, these objects have relations. For example, I'm carrying the microphone stand. That's a, a one-to-many one relationship between objects. Um, and you want to model that in a programming language by you know, a, a possession relation between these two objects, the me object and the microphone, the microphone stand object. The text, the program, the game is going to be outputting in text and accepting text commands describing actions and relations. You really want the program to be a piece of text which accepts simple commands, understands them, and you know, parses them out into relations. So the fact that the mapping between the problem and what the program is trying to do is very similar to the mapping between the game and what the, the player is trying to do really works in the language's favor. Um, that's why you know, verbs on the one side of the screen, you can see that it fits well with verbs on the other side of the screen. If I wanted to start the game with a microphone stand being carried by the player, I would say the microphone stand is carried by the player, and I have screwed that up. It will work. Now the game starts out with me carrying the microphone stand. And this works because is carried is a relationship that the compiler understands, and it's mapped directly into the world model. Um, the same is true between physical relationships. Uh, if I say, in this case, uh, north is a physical relationship. There's no verb associated with it. But if I type go north, it will take me to the kitchen. Um, the other thing that's going on here is there's a fairly strong uh, inference engine about in, in the compiler about what objects are. So I didn't have to say the kitchen is a room. I could have, um, but it is able to say the compiler is able to observe that kitchen is a term being that showed up in the program for the first time. It has a directional relationship with the room, therefore the kitchen must be a room, and it models it that way. Uh, there's a, a nice index tab which will display the most recent compilation and show you, here's a tiny little map. Here are, here's the contents of the game. And a lot of this comes out of the standard library, right? The player, the location, the score, these are all things that the, uh, the only the player is being used in the game at the moment. But if you Anyway. Anyway. 
here's a list of things in the game organized hierarchically uh, because it's a nice IDE. You can actually get these errors and uh, it'll locate them in the source code for you. So what else is interesting in here? The activity, uh, the engine of execution behind all of this is a nifty programming concept called rule-based programming. Um, this is actually my contribution to the system. I didn't build any of it, but I was in early discussion with Graham Nelson about how it should work and uh, our, our knowledge of how interactive fiction worked. Um, when I got started with this, I was using an earlier compiler language called Inform 5 uh, and later Inform 6. Those were very traditional programming languages. If you looked at them, you'd say, oh, that's C. I mean, it's C by somebody who hated the syntax of C, and so it changed with all the, the like, parentheses to square brackets. But it's C. It has a traditional C style compiler. Uh, which works in an expected way, two-phase compiler, generates a bunch of assembly code, an assembler assembles it, clunk, and have a program. And then he built a programming model behind it, which was you know, a traditional sort of object-oriented thing. Um, very familiar for the early 90s. The problem with object-oriented programming is that it doesn't really fit the model of interactive fiction. Object-oriented programming assumes that Anything you want to do is sort of specified by the type of the object you're doing it to, right? This batch is based on the type of the thing, and then maybe in a secondary sense, by the type of the arguments. So you first you, you lay out this big array of programming types in some abstract sense, and then like you throw a message at an object and the right thing happens. It's a nice concept, but in interactive fiction, you tend to have much more complicated uh, bits of code. Put the microphone stand back down. And start demonstrating that. So what's going on here is the engine parses what I type. It understands that there's an action, which is take, and a, a, a noun, which is the stand. And then it looks through its uh, list of rules about things that apply to the state of taking a microphone. Notice that it's already abstracted past the layer of individual words. It knows that microphone is the same as stand. It knows that take is the same as get. Um, that's all, that's all we'll look past that. <clears throat> this is, in the computer programming sense, a dispatch. But it's not based on the type of any particular argument. It's based on both the specific action and the specific verb. The specific action and the specific noun. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. I could say, check taking anything. This would be a horrible electrical world. It is a more general rule than the one that I had before. Uh, I don't have to dispatch based on objects. I can dispatch based on the verb as well. And I phrased that wrong because I have to use it slightly differently. That this is a distinction which I'm not going to give you now because it's too much work. But uh, you know that. This isn't very uh, physically realistic because I've blocked out every action, including ones that don't involve touching it. But from a programming sense, this is kind of cool. I've switched from a rule that's based on the action in question, all things, every taking action, to a rule which is based on the object any action involving the microphone stand uh, to an action which is based on both. And the language is fine with all of them. They're just different specificities of ways to interrupt what's going on. And I have this instead of, uh, there's a possibly overcomplicated uh, cycle of things happening in there, which includes a before stage and after stage. So I could have things that happen before taking the microphone after taking the microphone. <clears throat> so 
The reason I suggested this model originally was that it actually kind of fit the way that I was writing uh, IF code already. Like I, I'd taken the old uh, object-oriented system and kind of, which was kind of broken down this way, and I really, really wanted it to rip out the last vestiges of a C++ style object dispatch and move over entirely to this. And fortunately, Graham agreed with me and built the system this way, which is very nice of him, because otherwise I would have had to build it and uh, it would have taken several years longer. <clears throat> a game can be designed which is nothing but these tiny little snippets of code. And the compiler does all the work of glomming them together into efficient dispatch uh, sort of conditional tree structures. I what should I talk about next? What, 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 what aspects of I7 are interesting that I, uh, that I totally lost over? I like to talk a whole lot about the natural language, about the rule-based stuff, because you know that's my thing. The natural language stuff is cool, uh, but there it is, you've seen it. There's, yes, no. There's a whole lot of work put in uh, in relations. I'm not going to try to type that off the top of my head. There's an, uh, the manual, for example. I've mentioned each relationship like is north of, is carried by. You can define new relationships um, if you want your game to be about a social situation. You can define your relationships like loves or hates or controls or pays attention to, and then in your game you can write. You know, Steve loves Martha, and uh, during the game you can change those relationships, and you can have game results or game events which are based on you know the relationships between the characters they're interacting with. So it's a good substrate for modeling um, social games as well as the sort of traditional text adventure, uh, what people refer to as like the game of medium-sized dry goods, like things that are small enough you can pick them up discreetly, carry them around, unlock doors and so forth. Um, Contents. There is the recent release has added some semi-functional programming uh, to model. Uh, there isn't a concept of function per se, but there are phrases which serve the same programming uh, role as functions. Uh, functions can also be rule-based and be defined by many different snippets of code under different conditions based on what's being shoved into it, the conditions. That's another thing. The dispatch of rules doesn't have to be based on the arguments at all. I could say Steer the plane left to right. He wound up, he wound up like embedding 
fixed point uh, sign tables into the game. I'm sure it's uh, familiar to the demo crowd. Uh, it really didn't work very well at all, so it's all enthusiastic about the um, number and spent some time uh, coding that up. So instead of continuing down that list, I will ask if anybody has any questions or if anybody is uh, unclear about the benefits of all these random things I've been rambling on for the past 20 minutes. No, I think, yeah, yes. Um, um, how would the current um, language make up the context? So you say, well, okay, um, can you, how do you differentiate that you can, let's see, um, must first get the microphone cable plugged that into the microphone and then, but in, but in a way that you don't get in an eternal stuckness as many of the, the, uh, the CMI games, for instance, or if you, if you, if you, if you, if you get to pick up a model of the stuff, can you? Um, the language just, the question is about sort of, uh, Winding up plot constraints to make sure that the player doesn't get stuck by missing some, an essential object. Something, something like that. Yeah. Um, the language just the language doesn't have any specific um, mechanisms for dealing with that. I think because the IF world considers that to be the author's problem. I realize it's always a, a, a cop out when the language author says, "No, no, that's the designer's problem to worry about." But if you think about designing your game. Forgetting to bring an object along is only a problem if there's a one-way door, okay. right? Okay. And then also, you know, um, you can just define the rules by naming them somewhere. Yes. And then you can, and, and there is no specific syntax that you have a block of specific rules. You so you, you, you could say that the microphone is in the zone, you could put that at the bottom. Yes. You have, to, you have to declare a microphone person there above. Um, there are a couple, it, it is not perfect, but the idea of the language is that you can define things at any time and you can organize the code in any order you want. Um, there is a sectioning mechanism, you can say like chapter three, and it will uh, highlight that, and this doesn't affect the uh, compiled code, but when you go into your table of contents, uh, it'll let you like jump around the source code that way sort of as an alternative to the multi-source file uh, model of programming. Um, um, okay, um, and does this have a, a standalone runner, or do you still need to be in this specific application? It has a standalone runner, yes. Several, many of them. Right. This compiles to a couple of different formats. There are many uh, interpreters available. Most of, them, most of them are open source. The compiler is not currently open source, which is something that I keep nagging Graham about. He swears he's going to do a full source code release as soon as he has the language like up to 1.0, which you know might be in five years, who knows, but it is free to use at the moment. And the, the, the players, like the game players, uh, are open source of various varieties. And we ported it to, like there's a JavaScript port you can slap directly into your web page. I just released an, uh, an iPhone port. You can slap it directly into an iOS app and sell it that way if you feel like it. There's an Android app. There's a, a dozen different desktop uh, Windows on its Mac interpreters. Um, I should actually, like, with regard to your earlier question about getting the player stuck, completely independent of this, I have a little Python script which I don't have it on here directly, but is intended to let you solve that problem that lets you define your game as a series of abstract plot events rather than objects with constraints on them um, and chain them together and then it will run through and determine what uh, state events are reachable and which ones aren't. I have found this, I designed it to solve exactly that problem and it's been really useful for making the gigantic enormous game that I'm supposed to be working on and, and here instead of working on. Um, but for medium sized or small games, I think uh, most IF authors are just in the habit of dealing with that in their hands. Like you, you think about, well, for, the, for chapter one, the player can always back to all these rooms, and chapter two, he's taken to this other place, so I better make sure he has the right thing for them, and you sort of like break the problem down, look at it, make sure it's solved, and then you Anything else? Okay. I am. Val says I should put in a plug for Idiom Lands. This is the Kickstarter project, the giant game, which I uh, did as a Kickstarter very successfully 18 months ago. 
the game is not done. I'm not going to plug it because it's not done. I'm kind of embarrassed about it at this point, but uh, progress is being made. In the meantime, I'm working on releasing some of my old games for iOS to see if that makes me any money because I would like to get some money. Okay, I think we're now exactly half an hour behind, uh, just like we were going to start it, so I'll stop. 